Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, members, friends. We are going to start on time, and we are starting now. This is actually the last plenary session that we gather together for this conference. After this session, it will be lunch, it will be another parallels, and probably uh, many of us will be leaving or will not be meeting as a group again. So please treasure this last opportunity to meet together as a big group. And uh, at the end of, uh, of the session, I will uh, say a few words about farewell. Well, today is the uh, third keynote. And you remember we have the first one on liberty, the second one on quality. And we have Kathy and Tom uh, spoken with us. Today we have the third keynote, which is on humanity, and you will recall that these are the three core values that we would like to discuss in this conference in Seoul as a soul-searching exercise. Now today's uh, um, not working. Yes. Okay. Today's uh, program is roughly like this. I will open the session uh, with a very uh, quick introduction of our panelists, and then there will be a video. It's a piece of hard work by a lot of colleagues, including uh, many of you on, on the floor now. Uh, that will be a 15-minute uh, video, actually as a collection of videos. And then we'll go into uh, the discussions. Now, uh, the first part of the discussion is for our four uh, panelists to share their views on certain themes. And I have highlighted that probably, but it's not a must, that uh, when we talk about the challenges on humanity, especially relating to public opinion research, we probably should be visiting these one, two, three, four areas, and of course others as well like the uh, challenge of technology. And in Salzburg, last year we started with this AI challenge, and uh, we all know uh, the importance of uh, new technology, in particular, the very rapid development of AI, not just uh, have a huge impact on our daily life, but probably in the operation of our research. And I have been joking uh, with my colleagues in Hong Kong that probably in the future, we don't need all of you, I don't even need myself because all we need is an AI poster and uh, that poster is so knowledgeable that uh, it, I will use it, will use its own way of uh, interviewing everybody in some way I do not know and then come up with some kind of uh, biased uh, uh, results but the AI will be clever enough to do all the waiting, raking and everything fast so we'll be out of business. When will that happen? I do not know. But anyway, we have been discussing uh, artificial intelligence and, of course, in general, uh, technological challenges to us last year, and we should be continuing it. And uh, not just in this soul-searching exercise, but I believe in the future, a couple of years, conferences, that could be another huge topic that we should be following. And then, on the second uh, area, I think Back to square one of why we are doing opinion research, why we want people's voices to be heard, we probably, not a must, but we probably are thinking of how to resolve conflicts. And we are seeing a lot of uh, global problems now. Wars, sustainable growth, uh, 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 weather change, everything which affects humanity, but in particular, you know the war, uh, there are many wars happening, so humans are fighting. So do we have a role? So that would be another area which I hope we could touch on today. The third area and the fourth area, actually I deliberately split it into uh, three and four because it's really difficult to conceptualize the difference. But perhaps from a time perspective, we could look into what all these data are about and how it could help us. Uh, probably we could go into a data archive, uh, secondary analysis, whatever it is. So that is a historical perspective 
to this whole issue of humanity and opinion research. So we will touch on that. And uh, finally, uh, this is something interesting because that is another kind of perspective, and I would use humanities perspective. And uh, if we study, we, we try to define humanity is very difficult and also very general, just humankind. But humanities is sometimes defined as the, um, the kind of liberal arts approach to human beings. So today we also want to touch on it because there is this artistic perspective of public opinion, which I'd like to perhaps share a little bit with you through our guests. So our four speakers uh, uh, today would be Li Yunju, who is the immediate past president of International Communication Association, ICA. I think many of you know it very well. And she will, uh, after the video, and I think she has some slides too, share her views on the challenge of AI and misinformation, which is her area of expertise. Then we have our good old friend, uh, Colin, Colin Irvin, from the University of Liverpool. He will ex share with us more or less the second perspective about uh, applying peace polls and other, other methodological uh, uh, inventions uh, to try to tackle all these conflict zone issues, uh, national, global conflicts. So, uh, uh, Irvin uh, has a lot of experience and she, he will share with us, I think also with some PowerPoints. Then from the historical perspective, we're very glad to have the president of uh, Geises, Christoph Wolf, with us. And uh, you could know right away that uh, Christoph will be trying to share with us the historical perspective, how data archiving, everything uh, could help. And then uh, the uh, fourth speaker, uh, I have to say a few more words about it. Uh, he is Daniel Wessel uh, in Germany. And uh, he is the founder of Rimini Protocol, which has been uh, running performances for past uh, 15 to 20 years in a very uh, kind of a structured way of showing public opinion, statistics, demographics, via some stage shows in 42, I remember countries around the world. Uh, so that is something interesting. Uh, but however, Daniel could not be with us uh, this time. Actually, in last year in Salzburg, he was almost on the verge of uh, attending, but finally he couldn't make it. But this time, he still couldn't make it, but he has sent his representative, and we have uh, Zui Lai Simfong uh, from Hong Kong uh, speaking on his behalf. And uh, I will leave to Zui to explain uh, a bit more about the whole, whole connection with 100% uh, with, uh, 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 production. So that would be uh, the uh, flow. I hope um, we could spare some time for general discussions because in the past, in the last two keynotes, we didn't have time, but probably because they want to reserve all the discussion to today. So I look forward to discussions, chats amongst our panelists and also with all of you uh, to make this final plenary session memorable and productive. So I would now like to show you the video. So, uh, yes, please. Dear Weibo colleagues, members and friends, this is Robert Chong speaking. About two months before our 2024 annual conference, I started to call for donations of short videos on humanity. Thanks to many of you, we have collected quite many, and I myself feel obliged to make one myself. Humanity is very important. It should play a part in everything we do. As professionals, we are the World Association setting the standards of public opinion research. As scientists, we are truth seekers and all of us should passionately defend our right and freedom to speak the truth. However, these are not enough. We need to constantly ask ourselves why we are doing what we are doing. And our WAPOC constitution has provided us with the answer. 
It says that our mission is to serve humankind in a very special way. That is, to let people's voices to be heard. Each of us therefore has a duty to work as a part of the whole to serve humanity. And we should always bear in mind that the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts. Let us therefore work as hard as we possibly can in our own domain, but without losing the sight of humanity. Let there be unity in diversity, and let our soul-searching exercise go beyond the city of Seoul. I am Robert Chung, President of Weipo 2024. From the very beginning of civilization, humans have tried to come to grips with their circumstances and push ahead in the informed development of their societies through measurement, the acts of quantification and classification. At its core, societies record their activities and pass on their learnings to future generations by writing things down. In each of our societies, we ask, what are we doing? What are we thinking? What are our needs? Where do we want to go and how do we want to get there? We're not content to rely on spin, speculation, or punditry to answer these questions. They're too important. Important questions demand reliable data. So we go forth with our best methods, theoretically based, empirically tried and tested over the generations, professionally produced. Now, times change. Our methods have improved a little since the days of clay tokens, cuneiform markings, and the abacus. And in today's practice, we do a bit more than counting goats or sheaves of wheat. Uh, we explore the world of attitudes and behavior. We break down barriers uh, with our random samples, introducing otherwise disconnected elements of society to one another. Uh, but at its base, 9,000 years later, we're still at the same thing, contributing essential irreplaceable fact-based knowledge to the development of society and the progress of humanity. It's a noble profession and I'm proud to share it with you. In my perspective, humanity means that we have social justice, that we ha hold uh, our political stakeholders to account. And for that reason, InfoTruck has always had a Voice of the People poll that is conducted every quarter for the last 15 years. This poll asks two critical questions. The first one is, what is your opinion about, as a Kenyan, about the direction the country is taking? This is essentially meant to help the government of the day policy makers uh, and advisors, businesses, and also the general public understand what the pulse of the nation is. If the country is indeed going in the wrong direction, then it behooves on governments to listen and to see what it is that they should be doing. Very closely related to this question is the question, why? What are the key issues that are affecting you as a Kenyan today? And what are the key issues that you'd want government to actually address as a matter of priority? In dealing with these issues, we feel that opinion polling closely therefore intersects with elements of humanity in providing that intersection, uh, you know, that conduit that helps uh, the stakeholders who are, you know, the general public and poly policy makers really understand what it is that the collective will of the people wants. We do a lot to bring goodness to our society, and we do that by identifying issues which affect our societies. Say, for example, opinion polls can highlight prevalent problems such as discrimination or inequality. And by bringing these issues to light through our research, societies can address them with empathy and compassion. And we help not only scientists, but policymakers, governments, to make better decisions for the citizens.
UNICEF uses the research data to talk and advise governments, non-governmental organizations, to develop policies, systems, and legislation to prevent the violence against children in each country. They use for education tool, public campaigns, what to do, what not to do, for each country. Representative public opinion polls give a clear and direct voice to those members of society who have no other social, economic, cultural or political representation by, for example, different interest groups or political parties or professional associations. <clears throat> Humanity and humankind receives thus a direct and strong voice by representative opinion polls which can be heard as a consequence at the macro level of open and pluralistic societies. As I think there is a strong relation, uh, we believe that our indust industry serves this important uh, goals of the humanity and uh, human beings. Uh, we respect the people, we uh, ask for their opinions and try to, to transfer their opinions to the different stakeholders, to decision makers, to the media. So this is a strong relation that I believe we should do and uh, to express their opinion, opinions in a professional way in numbers, outcomes, reports, presentations. This is very important. Opinion polls are important tools that show what people think about certain issues and topics. By knowing others' opinions, people can rethink their own ideas and help form a social agreement. In Japan, many people feel they should not strongly express political opinions due to cultural reasons. It's important to gather and understand the opinions of these people. The result of opinion polls serves as crucial indicators for politicians and policy makers. While elections have the biggest impact on politics, opinion polls also reflect citizens' views and feelings influencing government policies. In Japan, media conducted opinion polls, especially those measuring the cabinet's approval rating, are very accurate. They can greatly influence the government ensuring that policies meet people's needs and respect humanity. So, as a Gen Zer, I am 27 years old, I have grown up in the internet. And to me, the internet and, you know, this new form of information technology communication that is worldwide and completely connected is a key aspect of what humanity itself is today and as disruptive as what the industrial revolution was back then. We are now being able to reconstruct and reform our whole way of thinking considering that we can communicate with people worldwide for all sorts of reasons. This new paradigm shift to me is key for the understanding of international public opinion. So, nowadays, if I would like to know what someone in South Korea or in 
Nigeria or in my Latin American neighbors, all I have to do is to check social media, you know? But the thing is, we cannot take scientific rigor out of the equation when we're looking to social media content. Even though it's easier to find out what people are talking about through social media platforms such as Twitter or Instagram or even Facebook, we need to be able to properly address the limitations and also, you know, the biases that come in this sort of environment. So, I would like to invite us all to look into the analysis of social media content and discourse with the academic rigor that comes from public opinion research. If we understand humanity as the quality or state of being human and recognize that one of its important traits is to have a generous behavioral disposition, then we in Waper, as a collective group of professionals, have great potential to contribute to the greater good. One way to do it, this is my proposal, is to jointly produce a global report on an important topic, a GREET. The GREET is a collective research project generated by voluntary participation of several Waper members each of them would include the same measurement scale or questions module in their own national surveys within an established time frame. The scale your module to be included in each grid would focus on a specific topic of one of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, defined by a waiver appointed committee and proposed to the members each year at the annual Congress. As you can see, the idea is simple, feasible, and powerful. And my hope is that you consider it a direct way that we as a collective can contribute to humanity. Uh, I have spent the last four decades of my professional life researching and teaching largely in India and I believe in these last four decades, I have had this wonderful opportunity to relate to humankind, to intervene in issues relating to human development and to see four decades of progress, not just in India, but across the world with regard to the human race. Let me just make two points at this point of time. First, over four decades of research and teaching has allowed me to interact with more than 40,000 undergraduates, postgraduates and researchers. And all these 40,000 people have allowed me to learn along with them. This is one of my greatest lessons from humanity. The opportunity to learn, the opportunity to grasp various perspectives and the opportunity to learn from different experiences across the world. As a researcher, I have been involved in survey-based popular opinion on society and politics. This has allowed me to directly view at the ground how people think, how changes in people's perspectives happen and what contributes to shaping public attitudes. Can there be a better way of understanding humanity? Can there be a better way of grasping the reality of humankind's experience than such a very interesting and fascinating world of survey research? So we should thank the editorial team for editing the video. And the editorial team comprises uh, Rico, Fizania, 
and uh, I Isabella. And um, I guarantee them that they will have, uh, and they did have 100% autonomy in editorial independence. So they spent a huge time uh, seeping through uh, around 20 or so videos are submitted to the Secretariat from our members. Some of them couldn't make it to Seoul, but uh, we cannot, I mean, the team cannot show all the videos, but they are all uploaded uh, on the uh, uh, humanity booth downstairs, and they will be made online uh, in our website in the future. So uh, that's uh, 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 the way we have handled the videos. And I think this is the time for our guest panelists to uh, share their uh, words of wisdom with us. And uh, first of all will be uh, uh, Leon Zhu. Hi, um, thank you for the introduction. I'm Eunju Lee from Seoul National University. And um, this is my first time attending WayPoor, but I know that many of my ICA friends attend WayPoor regularly. So it is my great pleasure and honor to be a part of this wonderful conference this year. And um, it is simply impossible to cover all the implications of technology, especially AI, for humanity. So um, let me just focus on the areas I'm more familiar with. The intersection between AI and misdisinformation, which has direct relevance to public opinion and public opinion research. And after we hear from our esteemed colleagues, then we can certainly broaden and exp expand the scope of our discussion on technology and AI and their implications for humanity as well. So first, the AI can serve as a propagator of misinformation. Now, according to the Global Risks Report 2024, published by the World Economic Forum, misinformation was considered the most severe risk over a two-year period and the fifth most severe risk over the next 10 years. And as you can see um, in the purple area, then misinformation is categorized as a technological risk along with adverse outcomes of frontier technologies and AI technologies. And it is also strongly related to so societal polarization and the erosion of human rights, which directly um, have some relevance to the um, effects on humanity. And how can AI help propagate misdisinformation? Perhaps the most notable example is synthetic media, particularly deepfakes. And well-known cases include a video of Ukraine President Zelensky urging his soldiers to surrender. And in May 2023, fake images of an explosion at the Pentagon caused a brief dip in stock market. And ironically, verified X accounts, supposedly trustworthy, contributed to the widespread dissemination of these fake images. In addition, automated bots and trolls are another example of how AI propagates misdisinformation. While bots can support a range of legitimate human activities, malicious actors can use them to manipulate popularity, ruin reputations, and spread propaganda. In fact, according to the UK Department for Business and Trade report, for e-commerce platforms, widely used by UK consumers. 11 to 15% of all reviews for three common product categories are fake. And not all these fake reviews are generated by bots, of course, but they are fabricated to improve the perceived quality and popularity of one's own products and services, or to damage the reputation of competitors. And interestingly enough, informing consumers that steps have been taken to moderate misleading content on the platform does not impact consumer purchasing behavior. And during the Hangzhou Asian Games in 2023, 
a South Korean portal site encouraged users to leave cheering messages ahead of the semi-final soccer match between South Korea and China. And the yellow line shows the number of cheering clicks for the Chinese team, the red line for the Korean team, and the blue line for the total. And according to the Korea Communications Commission, two overseas internet users left 20 million cheering clicks for the Chinese team within just a few hours. And the government officials regarded this as a serious case of public opinion manipulation. What matters here is not the nationality of these two individuals, but the egregious overrepresentation of their opinions. In fact, research on user comments on news websites has consistently shown that people infer public opinion from several user comments, which in turn affects their personal opinion. In one study, my co colleagues and I found that congruent user comments heightened the perceived congeniality of public opinion, which led to opinion polarization. More interestingly, when the same user comments were coded in the news article, their effects on perceived public opinion were significantly lessened. This gives malicious actors all the more reason to create fake accounts and post inauthentic comments. And recently, warnings about hallucination produced by generative AI have increased. When asked how many stones one should eat a day, Google's AI overviews responded that we should eat at least one with each meal or mix it into ice cream. And when asked how many Muslim presidents there have been in the United States, it says that former President Obama is Muslim. And it also claims that to quickly pass a kidney stone, one must drink two quarts of urine daily. Thankfully, <laughs> good news is that our group found that alerting people to potential er errors of generative AI improved the user's identification of hallucinations. That is, warnings led to a decrease in perceived accuracy and an increase in dislikes toward hallucinated content, but not genuine content as compared to the control group. Still, these findings suggest how susceptible users can be to potentially inaccurate false information. AI, however, can also serve as a mitigator of misdisinformation. First, AI can assist in fact-checking by quickly analyzing large volumes of data, cross-referencing facts, and identifying inconsistencies. Um, for instance, tools like Claim Buster use AI to streamline the fact-checking process. And setting aside how technologically feasible and reliable automated fact-checking is, we should also ask how receptive people are to AI-based fact-checking. And these are some findings from our own study. Not surprisingly, people who held stronger belief in the AI heuristic, meaning that AI is objective, neutral, and accurate, were more likely to accept the fact-check verdict produced by AI than those rendered by crowdsourcing. But the opposite was true for those who do not believe that AI is objective, neutral, and accurate. So the next question would be, okay, on what basis people have come to form such attitudes or general beliefs about AI? For sharing intention, the source effect was found only when the fact check verdict was incongruent with the participant's own belief. However, selective sharing measured by the greater willingness to share congruent rather than incongruent verdicts was attenuated when AI did the fact checking as compared to humans. Second, AI can also help detect deep fakes by analyzing inconsistencies in videos such as unnatural facial movements or irregularities in audio. However, the efficacy 
of labeling AI-generated content remains to be empirically tested. For instance, a study found that division in users' attitudes toward the platform labeling interventions, with half of the interviewees perceiving fact-checking labels as biased and punitive. Additionally, it is possible that direct disclosures of AI's involvement in content production and also modification might diminish trust in any content we encounter online, including real one. So I've covered how AI can play a significant role as both as a propagator and mitigator of misdisinformation, which has profound implications for humanity. And I look forward to expanding discussion further after hearing our colleagues' insightful talks. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. And uh, Colin, can I have you? Okay, so um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, so I was very generously given the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award by uh, Waypoint Asia Pacific uh, last year for the invention of peace poles. Um, so let me just explain to you roughly how they work. Okay, but I cannot take all the credit for this. Um, I learned all about uh, making peace from the Inuit uh, who I lived with for many years, uh, they live in a situation of mad, mutual assured destruction. And there's so many Inuit men being killed by hunting accidents that if they had war, there wouldn't be any Inuit. So they had to have lots of mechanisms in place to prevent war. Uh, one was they had the same language all the way from uh, Alaska to Greenland. In other words, they didn't have chiefs who could sort of organize you to go and make war. They had no word for war. You could only say, let us murder many people. Um, and the most important thing is, when it came to making difficult decisions, everyone had to agree it was done by consensus. Uh, that's my daughter um, in an igloo, and that is uh, uh, my extended family uh, in the Arctic. And you'll notice that everybody is on their phone because they have um, very, very good internet connection with Skynet, uh, sorry, Starnet, uh, Starnet, and um, they have G GPT-4 um, and good AI uh, communications, but they don't have doctors and they don't have psychologists and they don't have a lot of other things that we take for granted, but they do have good access to, to artificial intelligence. So history of polling, as Tom has often mentioned, the, the first time that uh, um, uh, polling was used in the war situation was in the Second World War, uh, the uh, Americans wanted to invade Italy. They wanted to know, do we have to fight both the Germans and the Italians? The Gallup came back and said, you only have to fight the, the Germans, so they invaded and, and all went well. Now, to use them for, for in a peace situation, I first did this in Northern Ireland, and we had three rules. And these rules are really very, very important. First of all, all the parties to the conflict should agree and draft all the questions so that no one can say it was the wrong question. Secondly, all the parties, all, all the populations in the conflict should be asked all the questions so there can be no disagreement about the methodology. You can't go and spend uh, $100,000 doing all the polling and then someone said, well, you, that was a bad sample. That would be a waste of time. Thirdly, all the results must be made public. Otherwise, people can hide the results, walk away from the results, and it doesn't work. Uh, the other thing is we had a very special scale. Um, it's not a binary scale going from essential, I've got to have it in the deal, all the way through to tolerable. That means uh, I don't like it, but I'll accept it for, for peace. And unacceptable means I'm going to carry on fighting. It's not a normal binary scale, but it works very well for negotiators. So here's an example of just one of hundreds of items that were tested in Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland peace process. Um, the, the item one there, we've got the Protestants, they really didn't want to have any relationship between the North and the South of Ireland and, and legislation for it. Item six is what uh, the, the, um, 
the uh, Catholics could uh, not put up with. If there was no relationship between the North and South, 69% were going to say, we can't accept it. So the compromise was item number three, that is they would have deals on North and South, but they would be legislated separately in the Parliament in the North and in the South. So they would separately, and that, that compromise uh, ended up in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, and we had hundreds of items like that, and we wrote in a peace agreement, and it works. And of course, everything was published, everything was transparent, um, and this was a, a paper and pencil exercise, um, and this was 25 years ago. So now, in the last few years, I've been working with Remish AI and the United Nations to develop artificial intelligence to do the same thing. And uh, this is a, a slide. What happens is uh, you get asked a question, you can get up to a thousand people in a chat, and you uh, get given a, a couple of uh, uh, suggestions from other people in the chat, say, which one do you prefer? This all gets crunched by the computers, and uh, it can uh, figure all, all this stuff out and uh, find out what people can agree to. Here's an example from uh, Libya um, and what people could agree to in Libya. And when we ran this uh, in Libya, it led to a ceasefire. We could use a ceasefire in uh, Israel and Palestine, but unfortunately, this technology is not being used there uh, at this time, although it could be. Um, so the wonderful thing about the Libyan stuff is that we could publish the real-time dialogue on Facebook and then publish that on a TV channel. We got 1.4 million in a real-time dialogue. Um, and uh, that uh, dialogue um, led to a ceasefire. It would normally, normally take me a couple of weeks or sometimes a couple of months to run the stuff with the paper and, paper, uh, paper and pencil exercise in Northern Ireland. But this was done in real-time, and in real-time, we got a ceasefire. So uh, then I started working with OpenAI. Uh, what OpenAI wanted to counter all the difficulties that we heard about just in the previous presentation. I mean, like any new invention, it's a double-edged sword. It can be for good or it can be for bad. So we heard all the wonderfully uh, uh, synopsis of all the bad things that can happen with AI, but they wanted to make it democratic. They wanted it to be answerable to the people. So uh, we were one of a team to do that, and uh, that was with Andrew Conyer of Remish AI and uh, other individuals. And um, the way the process works, and this is where all of you and everyone here needs to be part of the process, is first of all, we would ask on a particular topic, and the one I was working on was how should AI respond to questions about war and conflict. And we asked the, the, the population, well, what should be the regulations? We then took those regulations um, and perfected them, uh, refined them with GPT-4. We then run those past some experts, and actually they were colleagues in the UN. And then we would run that back through the public again. And we do this a couple of times, and then finally run it uh, through a, a Python program, uh, through all the human rights legislation, to make sure there were no conflicts there, because that's tapping into the wisdom of human history, which is where uh, all the human rights have come from. And then we would end up with, um, uh, this, this is uh, the constitution for how um, open AI, uh, artificial intelligence, should deal with questions about war and conflict. And this is all available on the Waypoint website. You can download it and have a look at it. And uh, we, we tested this against the population, um, and uh, it was very high consensus uh, that this was a sensible way to go about it, but I won't go into the details here. Um, but it, it, that was to counter... Okay, you want to take a picture? <laughs> so, uh, this is to counter all the problems that we heard about in the previous presentation. If you do all this stuff, you don't get into the trouble that we've just been, had explained to us. Um, and this is a peace agreement done by Khalil Shikaki in Israel and Palestine. Um, now, to, it took us a couple of weeks to write that constitution for artificial intelligence. It probably took Khalil Shikaki several years to develop this uh, peace agreement. Um, but what one can do is one can, using artificial intelligence, we could write that peace agreement uh, in a couple of weeks, and we could do that for any conflict anywhere in the world. Um, 
But the, the, the critical thing is it must be inclusive, it must be transparent, and it must be accountable. And um, the, uh, that, that, that was the case in Northern Ireland, but uh, I've been doing these peace polls around the world. Generally, that's not the case. So with all the stuff that uh, I've been doing with the, with the UN, um, none of that gets published because the UN are understandably very nervous about criticism. I mean, one just has to follow the news of what's happening in Israel and Palestine. So they don't publish anything because it might upset one of the member states. Critically, it might upset one of the permanent five members. And if you upset one of the permanent five members, then they can shut down your mission when it comes up for renewal next year and you'll be out of a job. Similarly, uh, I've been working for the OSCE in, uh, in Moldova and Transnistria, and every member of the OSCE has a veto. So uh, the research only went as far as it did. They were concerned that the Russia might shut down the mission, so um, the research got stopped. So how do we overcome this problem? Well, um, so th these are all the problems, um, and I'm, I'm kind of hoping that um, maybe when we get to artificial general intelligence, OpenAI now have over 20 million uh, users around the world. Uh, those 20 million users, if you know the ID and they're not bots, uh, they can become a global panel. So artificial general intelligence, you could ask a question, well, what could people agree to on this or that problem? and artificial general intelligence could come back with that. You could even get artificial general intelligence when we get to it. I mean, all that stuff that was done with, with, with human beings um, earlier on could be done with human beings with a, a global panel, which artificial general intelligence would have access to. And you could say, well, please write me a peace agreement. But then what would happen is who, who controls the artificial general intelligence? It might come back and say, I'm sorry, but I'm not permitted to do that. So we still have a problem. Um, we've got these wonderful tools. They can be used for good reasons or bad reasons. Uh, we try, OpenAI are trying to do it for the good reasons, um, but we still don't know if it's all gonna work out. The thing is, um, we in this room know everything about what's going, I mean, you take the national representatives, they know what's going on in their country and they understand it very well. Our colleagues who do polling around the world on conflicts, and there are, there are several in this room, um, they know exactly how the conflicts work, what they tick, they can, they can, uh, they, they see what dangers are coming down the road. We are a very knowledgeable bunch of people and there's no reason why I mean, for, for the Israel-Palestine uh, conflict, uh, those people who were in my, my session yesterday, we knew 15 years ago exactly how to solve that conflict and get to peace. And w we had all the parameters there in front of us. Um, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't executed. Um, so the problem is, uh, frankly, nobody had to die in Israel and Palestine. What happened on October 7th didn't have to happen. Uh, the, Thousand, more than a thousand Israelis killed, now 40,000 plus uh, Palestinians killed. It actually didn't have to happen. It could have been prevented when I was working with George Mitchell, who's special envoy to the Middle East then. Uh, we, could have, we could have solved the problem, but the political currents at the time uh, in Israel and uh, domestic politics in America just prevented us from doing it. We know how to make peace. We know how to prevent conflict, um, but we, we, we just have to find a way around the politics of it to, to get it done. So here's some links. Um, you can go to my uh, uh, presentation on, on, the, on the WAPOR website and you can explore those links and figure out how we can get around this problem. AGI may not be able to do it, but we can do it if we, if we have a mind to. Thank you. Thank you, Conan. So Christoph, it's not time. Thank you. Yeah, good uh, morning, everyone. Um, I'm afraid I will disappoint Robert and maybe you because I'm not going to talk at length about the history of data collection or data archiving, but I will talk a little bit about data collection, 
and, and I'll have a end note on data archiving. I will reflect more than I have anything to present. So um, I was asking myself now how the next slide comes up. That is one of the questions I have. There it is. So first of all, let me begin with just telling you, and probably you would all agree, but I know there are a lot of people out there that might not agree, that I assume that there is a reality out there that is worth exploring and that we as social scientists and other scientists and also other people with other um, uh, ways to explore reality, there is actually something to understand. There is something to learn. And uh, so I'm convinced that there is a way to get to at least approximately understand reality by, for example, means of social research. And the second premise I have is that, or the presumption is that I am convinced that we can make better decisions based on what we learn about the world. So we need data. That is uh, the beginning of, of my thoughts. Question is any data? I would say no. And here I uh, referred to Tom's talk uh, the other day. It really depends on the quality of the data. We don't need fake data. That would not help us, right? We need data that was produced and is accurate, valid, reliable. All these things Tom has talked about, we have be, to be aware of error sources and do whatever we can to eliminate error. So we need to really know about the data generation process, about sampling, the questionnaire, field work, efforts, whatever uh, it takes to generate data in our field. And you know much better than I that what is needed is rigorous methodology. So the question then is, um, does high quality data serve humanity? I would say not necessarily. And I think that is a point to reflect on. Um, and as Colin has mentioned, most things, AI was mentioned, but also just data can be used to further the human good, but it can also be used to harm humans. And I want to tell you a story about a German sociologist Andreas Walter, he was trained partly in the US in the Chicago School of Urban Research with Park and Burgess and learned all these wonderful methods to do urban research, to uh, look for different ethnicities, to analyze urban quarters and urban groups and conflict in urban uh, settings. And he was tasked in 1935 to accompany a re or demolition and re-establishment of a certain quarter in Hamburg, one of the largest cities in Germany, where there were suspect individuals living, right? So there were a lot of communists, a lot of unworthy people, a lot of Jews. So he went there with his staff. He was a professor at the University of Hamburg at that time and carefully charted this urban area and the living places of each of these individuals, their status, and it produced wonderful, colorful maps, just like he learned in Chicago, where different people lived. And what did he say? So this is a rough translation. It says any urban redevelopment that not only wants to replace bad houses with better ones, but also is responsible for the national future in the long term requires preparation through sociological studies. These surveys must come to the point where it can be determined how to deal with the individual people in the demolition area, 
transplant those who are only infected into healthy circles of life, control those who are not under control, eradicate the genetic material of biologically hopelessly defective. So this is putting science into a certain political cause, a cause that from today's point of view we would think is absolutely wrong, but it just shows me that data and good scientific methods is not enough. I believe that to serve humanity, we do need good data. These data must have or must be openly available so that we can share them, that we can look at them from different perspectives. We need well-trained researchers who are responsible, but Andreas Walter was well-trained. And that is, I think we need one more or two more ingredients. We need open discourse, open society, and international collaboration. Um, and I think together, these ingredients might actually help us to further the cause of humanity based on data. And I just invite you to check out the UNESCO recommendations on open science that go along in this line. And then I'll end with a note on data archives. I think they do serve a very important function in this uh, situation. They preserve the data. They also have a mandate or, or are at least able to and do safeguard quality of data, not least through data curation. Um, and uh, it's not only the data, but also related documents, questionnaires, fieldwork protocols, all these things you need to know about to assess the quality of data. And finally, they're the agents to disseminate data and uh, um, organize data access in a transparent, fair way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christoph. You didn't disappoint me at all. I really love your presentation. Thank you. So the next and uh, last uh, panel speaker is uh, Sui Lai, speaking uh, on behalf of Daniel Wessel. And you will realize that there's another perspective to public opinion, which many of us might not be too familiar with. So, Sui. Thank you. I now speak in the name of Daniel Vessel. Here. Dear listeners, the experts in statistics, I cordially greet you from Berlin, Germany. While I'm sleeping, to you here in Seoul, Korea. Actually, I'm gratefully speaking to you with the help and voices of Sim Sim. I personally am sleeping. My name is Daniel Vessel. If I was where Sim Sim is now, you would see a person in the mid-50s, a typical Caucasian-looking guy, no hair, three days not shaved. By playing this game, I try to make a serious point. I am present now, although I'm not visible and away, even sleeping. While being represented by another person who currently interprets for you what I say. And this is a very super classical method in theater. Only that Hamlet has already died. Shakespeare as well. And it is yet a person who speaks their words. Both for you experts in statistics as well as for us working in theater, the question of representation is the key. In both fields, it's all about generating experiences of our present reality. 
by visualizing aspects of it in forms of representation and to interpret them. Since the 2000, uh, year 2000, we at Remedy Protocol used to stage, in a way, reverse engineering theater by playing other games in representation. In many theater productions, we have been inviting on stage people who have not been chosen or trained to be theater or film actors, and who we call instead real people people in their own kinds. Or more precise, theater in their own kinds. We have made plenty of performances focusing on their lives, biographies, and experiences. For example, in how to turn trash on the street into money, or scientists, or like you, statisticians, of course, we always tend to research in new fields. Theatre for us is a process of learning about each other, both for us, but also for the audience. And mainly with and about people we, or you, otherwise, would hardly have the chance to listen to. So in the year 2007, we asked ourselves, what if we could create a body of 100 people representing not their own experiences and lives, but the entity of the society they live in. A body that can say, we hundred people are entitled to represent our city as a whole. Um, oops, is the, oh, here, yes. We are Berlin, for example. And this body with 100 heads say, for example, we are Tokyo. In the foyer, um, you can see, uh, you can watch a couple of video excerpts from various cities in which this format has been adapted by us, including Guangzhou in 2014, Kaohsiung in 2020, and Hong Kong in the year of 2021, with Dr. Robert Jong here as the chief statistician for and of the piece on stage. In the foyer, you can watch a video in which Dr. Jong explained the method, how we create the sample. You, how many people would you represent if you would stand on stage together with 99 others? 100% City has been staged in 44 cities around the world so far. Every city challenges our format in specific ways. While we are adapting a rather rough search filter with just five, five criteria, it is both an aim and a challenge to extend the diversity of the cast, especially towards the right wings, conservative, or more phobic spheres of our societies. The rehearsals and shows then lead to an interesting paradox. We like to show a city in its diversity, but the process of spending time together working towards a mutual goal, making participants change their minds at times, or at least to design they don't want to confront others openly. We have often seen people with clearly racist or anti-LGBTI plus statements. Explain a few rehearsals later, they would not like to maintain their statements. A significant proportion of the cast in Darwin, Austria, initially stood on the not me, which is the no side, when responding to the question who thinks that only heterosexual couples should be permitted to adopt children, which clearly mirror the stance on the topic in Darwin in the year 2015. However, by the dress rehearsal, nobody was standing there any longer. The rehearsal process has falsified the results in terms of representation. 
but at the same time had generated an amazing social result with the sample out of 142,000 inhabitants of Darwin. Nobody in this city seems to be against same-sex parents. As theatre makers, we were faced with a choice. Should we re erase the question? Because it, could not, because it could make all other statements appear equally inappropriate? Or to document what happens when people of very diverse few just spend a little time together, just a few hours, and having a mutual enemy, the audience. In this case, we highlighted what we had happened also to the audience. In order to emphasize to everyone exactly this, some people here on stage have changed their minds. Just because they had a chance to share the same space and time, this is why we believe that theatre, also when it does not operate based on statistic, but still gives the stage to what we call, quote, real people who can only represent a version of themselves. In this theatre, it's a place where we can heal, especially from the toxic way of communication that seems to dominate the so-called social media. Each of these performances works like a mirror of the city we live in. Numbers have turned into faces that both represent more than themselves, but also are individuals. And unlike in survey and statistics, you can follow the individual paths through the roundabout of 100 questions each performance make them ask. So these are the performances that have been made in the past uh, 15 years. And this is the question. Would you listeners always answer truthfully to all questions being exposed on stage? Other question. Would you do that when filing, uh, filling out a survey online or on the phone? Actually, it should be this one. Yeah, we asked on stage who had pay sex, uh, but in a hidden way. Yeah. A significant proportion of the hundred actors of themselves in every city respond with a yes. That is a very provisoric but important last aspect I can mention here. This theatrical oracle, based on statistics, also generates the paradoxes in us and our society that are so important not to forget because they make our life what it is. That's the end of the presentation. And this is the real Daniel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Thank you very much, Sue, and uh, thanks uh, all the panelists. Uh, since this is a round table, we would love to have more interactions, but uh, before opening to the floor, I would just ask uh, all our fellow panelists, do you have any questions to raise to any other panelists? If I, please I go ahead. <laughs> because Robert asked us to come up with some questions to each other. <laughs> so I have a question for you. And also, um, maybe it's relevant to you as well, because it has to do with the um, data collection and also data use. Because well, when we talk about the development and the use of AI, um, there's no shortage of discussion on the um, quality of data and also bias in data and so on. So it is really crucial to have high quality data to be able to develop high quality functioning AI. But um, when we talk about um, data collection, I think the key questions that we have to consider include who collects the data and whose data are collected and um, do we really have the informed consent from those whose data are being collected and used and are they really 
aware of how their personal data will be used for what purposes. So I think that that aspect has not been uh, fully discussed because we were only given like 10 minutes each. <laughs> so maybe this is a good opportunity for you to sort of elaborate on that aspect of data collection and data use and how that serves the purpose of humanity in general. Okay, so um, I think what you need here is somebody from OpenAI to answer that question. What happened was with the project that I was involved in is that uh, OpenAI decided they wanted to democratize the, the management of artificial intelligence. So they put out a grant application, um, ten, ten, people, 10 groups would get $100,000 each to come up with a process to democratize um, the, the, the constitutional aspects of, of AI. Um, there were a thousand applications and my team with uh, Remish AI uh, were one of the teams that w were in there. So th the way we went about it was we kept going back to the public and asking them, are, the, are these regulations okay? And then going through um, some experts vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, war and conflict, our experts were the UN. When we were dealing with vaccinations or medical questions, our experts were, were medical practitioners. And then, of course, we ran it all through human rights. So if, you, if we got up the slide here for the war and conflict thing, there are a lot of epistemological questions, that, that, that people should have references, no harm must be done. There's a whole bunch of regulations in there that uh, open AI, uh, must follow if you ask a question about, about war and conflict. Um, now the implementation of that um, is, is a question you need to put to Sam Alton, the, uh, the uh, CEO of, of OpenAI. Um, they know what they have to do and they know how to do it. Uh, whether they do it or not uh, is a matter for governments and regulators around the world and I have no, no influence on that. But we know what to do and how to do it. It's just a matter of, will they do it? Thank you uh, for the question, because it also reminds me of a confusion we often have when we talk about data. Because we have to be more specific what kind of data we talk about. And I referred mostly to survey data. And in that case, I think we have good answers on how to achieve representation or at least uh, assess the degree to which a sample represents a given population. And uh, informed consent is one of the ethical ingredients, I think, of our profession. However, if we look at new social research, doing research on social media, for example, we don't really know how to assess how representative social media activity is. We, we know that it is very selective, but to which degree it actually represents what part of the population I think is still a very open question and something that has to be assessed more carefully in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think I should ask the floor first to see if any one of uh, us here has any uh, comments, questions. Uh, if you do, please raise your hand and we will give you the microphone. Any questions for us? Yes, we have one. Uh, somebody? Microphone, please. Yes. There it is. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, I have a little, um, um, I would like to ask uh, Christoph Wolf uh, to elaborate a little bit more um, on, his, on his presentation. I appreciate very much the, the reflection that you open. Uh, science, good science per se, is not necessarily good or bad. It's uh, how we implement it that can help. But uh, I have a kind of feeling that um, the ingredients that you mention to help uh, have, uh, you know, progress out of good science might not be sufficient. The reasoning is this one. I'm thinking about some 
examples, if you want, the, the first of the class of modern democracies, in which decisions, however, are biased by intervention of uh, lobbies or uh, think tanks that uh, work for the benefit of specific narrow groups and not necessary for the good of the society as a whole. So I had the feeling that in the ingredients you were mentioning before, there is something missing. Um, would you like to, um, what, what could that be? How can we actually improve the outcome also of, uh, of research for the common good? Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. I think this is a question that also others here at the podium probably could take. Um, so I, let me rephrase the question, maybe. Um, first of all, by, by giving you the following answer, I, I was not reflecting on how we as scientists achieve policy results that directly affect society, right? I think it's important to note, at least in my mind, that as scientists, we are tasked, or, or much of our work is on finding out what is out there, and then maybe based on these findings, have recommendation for policymakers. But as scientists, we're not the policymakers. So, as policymaker, of course, I have to listen to many voices. I have the lobbyists, I have the scientists, I have citizens, I have uh, other stakeholders. Um, and I think that's a totally different arena and game, and that's nothing I have reflected on uh, in my talk. Um, but I think even in the smaller arena of science, we all are, to a greater or lesser extent, driven by personal interests, by political interests, and have diverging views on probably every issue that you can imagine. And so I think we come closer to um, a good description of a situation and then possibly a good recommendation to improve a situation by looking from different perspectives. And that is, uh, in my view, th this is meant, um, or this element of openness and of, of having, or scientific work being a work in collaboration, not only national but also international collaboration, being open, uh, open method, methods, open data, so that every step of my work can be criticized. Uh, we can revisit decisions I made in my data collection, in my, uh, in my analyses, in my inference, um, and that this basically is the process uh, in which, um, not truth, but say a, a good description of what is in the world or um, can be reached. That's my firm conviction. But again, I think policy making then is really a totally different field. Well, I don't think I have an answer to your question, but I. Um, have to say that your comments and question um, resonate really well with the personal struggle that I have been having <laughs> while doing some research on so-called AI, um, human-centered AI, or AI for humanity. So we talk about these phrases all the time, and we talk about responsible AI and trustworthy AI and so on. And all the time, people talk about, OK, AI for good and AI for human. And my question um, is that, well, when we talk about AI for humanity or human-centered AI, who is that human, right? So aren't we treating um, humans as if it is a monolithic entity? Um, so by doing it, by phrasing it in such a way, um, aren't we running the risk of um, covering or masking the inequality and also some prejudice and discrimination inherently um, operating in our society? So that's some um, question that I have been struggling with uh, whenever I hear the, oh, 
good sounding question, <laughs> human-centered AI. So I just have to share that, well, that's something that as a researcher, I totally agree with Robert that we are truth seekers. And in a more humble way, we try to describe what it is as accurately and as precisely as possible. And based on the data and evidence, we would well, be able to provide some recommendations. But I always feel that there is a huge gap between what we know is happening and what we should do in order to address the problems uh, that we have identified. So well, I think well, this is something that we as social scientists are constantly sort of grappling with. I guess the one thing that I would add here is um, uh, my PhD supervisor, uh, one, of the, one of the finest epistemologists and social science, and science methodologists, uh, Donald Campbell of the, of the last century, uh, triangulate. Don't rely on one methodology. If your focus groups, if your polling, if uh, this method and that method, if it br brings you to the same ends, insight, then you're probably getting somewhere close to truth. So um, we, we tried to do that uh, with, with OpenAI by going, going to the public, going to the experts, going to human wisdom, which is all the, the human rights uh, standards and the UN Charter. And if we got an answer that uh, co complied with all these different methodologies, triangulation, then you're probably going to get as close to something that is looks like the truth that, uh, that you can. But don't rely on, on one thing at all. Thank you. I wonder if the floor has uh, any more questions. Uh, this will be the last one because time is running out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fritz Spangenberg is my name. I'm from the Netherlands. Thank you, panel. Very inspiring. Um, I would like to maybe reintroduce some old-fashioned values like ethics and morale. Um, if I was employed by an autocratic leader, uh, it would be within my responsibility to come to awful solutions like eradicating maybe some minority groups. Who is responsible? So if we put ethics and morale on a higher level, then it's, that is more of a responsibility than listening to an autocratic leader or a company that only runs for shareholder values, which I think is also a very uh, sick idea of our society. Now, what I heard in this panel, life, lives could have been saved by the knowledge and the intellect we have in this group. And um, I think it's um, a question we should take all home or work on that as long as we are here. How can we help with our knowledge? Do we all want to retire to our tables and statistics when we come home? Or do we think together of coming to some solutions in saving lives in um, areas where conflicts and war are happening? Wouldn't it be a fantastic idea that Vapor serves in this problem that is relevant to uh, the whole of the world? I think Vapor can do that. It's one of the few organizations, maybe the only organization, that has knowledge and techniques to change the world. Panel, please. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, Chris for your uh, very inspiring comments and, uh, and advice to us. Uh, I think uh, I'll wrap up this uh, round table a bit. And I hope we'll continue discussion over lunch and the uh, afternoon. Um, I, I, I like to uh, wrap up the discussion uh, with a little bit of recapitulation of what I presented in uh, Dubai uh, almost two years ago. And that was my PowerPoint then. And I, this, of course, uh, this morning I'm extracting it. Uh, I was actually trying to do some self-reflection, and of course what Fritz has uh, just bring out, uh, what Vapor should be doing after, uh, then, by then it was 25 years of uh, history, but now it's 77. 
So I came up with this uh, triangle, and now you know, liberty, equality, and humanity. Uh, I tried to reflect what we were doing in a very broad and philosophical sense. So I think, uh, well, fortunately, this year we are really pinning down the three and discussing them. But uh, this is not uh, the end, because there are so many questions and so many uh, new developments that we need to tackle. But at the end, I think, uh, out of the three uh, core values, I myself consider humanity to be most important because we just mentioned, uh, and we have a question from the floor, how could you know that you are the best, uh, you're a good scientist, and how do we know that you are a good artist? Uh, we are doing everything as, as professionally, as hard as we could, but do you know you are doing good or evil? But we have to ask ourselves always this question. So we are all here to serve humankind and humanity. So uh, in Dubai, I said, uh, well, uh, looking down for the seven five years of history, Waypo started in forty seven, and we've done so many uh, new changes. But by then, it was twenty twenty two. I used blue to say perhaps beyond uh, twenty two, Waypo should be developing along uh, these lines. But I won't go into the details. Uh, what about the horizontal uh, spectrum? The review, and uh, in in Dubai, we did have a his history review of uh, of. Uh, Waypo, and we're still doing those uh, reviews, and we are compiling books on it. Uh, I, I sort of found that, well, we had been very strong in all these um, uh, methodological uh, thematic studies in the past, but what about the future? So by that time, I said, if we really have some core values guiding us, then maybe in every conference we meet, we should spend some time on discussing it, whether it's a major theme or a minor theme or just a simple session, it should be part of the discussion. But of course, there are others uh, happening, like AI two years ago. Uh, two years ago, I think we were not talking about AI that much. We were talking about virtual reality uh, and also a big data. So that is a horizontal axis. So I put them all together with a core value on the top, and then we have uh, all these dimensions of historical development, and I put a circle around it. I was advocating, and I'm still advocating, that we are just one world. And of course, we are the World Association, so we should bear in mind that we have a big circle around us. It is the world. And two years ago, and I think it's still correct now, we have the AI, we have the virtual reality, so it's a little bit more than the actual physical world. We still have those, I don't know what, virtual world, but remember there are almost another, uh, uh, another boundary beyond our, our physical world. So that was the uh, little uh, kind of gimmick I, I generated, that the dark blue is the time, but well, we are in the middle of the cross, so we should be spreading widely, and we also should be developing along a time axis, and bear in mind all these uh, bigger circle, square, universe, whatever you like to call it. So that was something. And uh, I actually, yes. I make a little animation, and I post it in my social media. I will explain what this is. So if you see me doing it again, you know exactly what I was trying to, to advocate. Last night, I looked at our Waypoint history, and I went into our archive online, take out a snapshot of the newsletter 2021, I found our logo then was like this. And then somehow, same year, second quarter, the logo was the same, it changed color. Okay. And then in 2010, we have a new logo. I don't know the history, uh, uh, our historian might be uh, researching it, but I just go through a uh, history I could see. Waypost logo has changed, we have a globe. Of course, we have a globe all around, but we have a new globe. And then uh, another time, we have almost the same logo, but the, but the center of the Earth is a little bit different. And where are we now? This should be our current logo that you've been looking at. So you see where the center of the Earth is? Uh, well, it's, maybe it's arbitrary, maybe it's random, but at least we have this waypoint. And what I am proposing, well, maybe the executive council, the full council, 
we'll have to take some time into exploring whether our logo could be enhanced a little bit, that we are one world revolving, moving all the time. And if we are meeting in Seoul, then perhaps Seoul should be in the center of that event, I mean the logo. So if we are in uh, St. Louis, then America should be in that. Well, this is just chemical. But the meaning behind it is that, do bear in mind that we are the World Association. We are now going through all these uh, core value review, but of course, we don't always talk about core values. We are not philosophers, okay? We are scientists, and of course, uh, we are also have our artists, but we are human beings. So we have to ask ourselves why we are doing all these, and uh, this is the purpose of this plenary session, and I thank you very much for attending it. And uh, since this would be the uh, last kind of uh, plenary or meet together, so I think uh, I should just say that uh, this is not exactly a closing. Uh, we still have events. And somehow, uh, deliberately, uh, this conference does not have a closing session. Previously, we have a closing uh, speeches. But I think uh, it is more important to know that we have no ending. We do not need a closing. Okay, so we just go, move on and on. And uh, next year, at least for the conferences, in uh, August, uh, sorry, in May, uh, we'll be meeting in St. Louis, uh, so we move on. And uh, in November, we'll be meeting in Tokyo, I mean the WAP, Asia Pacific, and there will be other conferences around the world. So I hope uh, I'll be seeing all of you. Uh, I cannot represent uh, conference chairman and everybody to thank you, but at this point in time, I really like to express myself on my, myself and also on behalf of uh, all of you. A big thank to our uh, conference chairman, uh, Jibong Kim. Where are you, Jibong? Uh, he's there, Jibong. <laughs> so we thank you uh, very much. And I think uh, I should declare this session closed, but I shouldn't declare the conference closed because it's still going on. And as I said, we do not need really an ending. We should be moving on and on. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you. <laughs> I believe this is a lucky draw, right? Lucky draw before the lunch. Yes, this would be, uh, I think, uh, Jibung or the organizing team uh, should be taking over. But as far as our session is concerned, it's done. So please come up and uh, give us the best of luck of everything. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and hello once again. Uh, we hope you're enjoying the final day of the conference. We are PMI, co-host of Vapor and a leading research company with the largest online panel pool in Korea. We conduct various surveys, including marketing research, public opinion polls, and academic studies. PMI is also recognized for its expertise in digital quantitative research and big data analysis. If you have any question about us, you can find our contact detail in our company's brochure provided in the back you received at registration. Uh, in response to your enthusiastic participation, we have uh, increased the number of total prices to 17. Uh, we also have a special guest to assist with today's draw. Please give a warm welcome to PMI CEO Min Hee Cho. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for staying with us until the last day, April. Uh, how about Korean culture and hospitality? This way for in Seoul. Uh, we have uh, this, uh, this wafer has been a great chance for you to make new friends. We have a drugstore prepared 
uh, Korean traditional goods for today as well. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Uh, we will be calling out uh, names and once your name has been called please come up to the stage so that you can collect your prize and take a picture with us let's get started right away for our first prize we have the five pouch bags meredith massey congratulations yambo lee yambo lee from uiuc Libby Ceramet, Libby Ceramet from D3 Design Data Decisions. Not present? Okay. Rosario Aguilar, congratulations. Ellen Lust, Ellen Lust. Hanning Silver, not present. Jinju Ko from Gallup, not here. Reginald Ugodon, Reginald. Paula Bordondini. Congratulations. And Erica on Metheny. Erica from GLD. Not present. Masahi Masahisa Enko. I'm sorry if I don't get it right. Masahisa. Christoph Wolf. Okay. Oh, Chris. Yeah, we're gonna see the pictures Thank you very much. Uh, for the next prize, we have a uh, Korea traditional Celadon soju glass and a Celadon tumbler. We will select one each. Yulia Dani Danilina. And Deborah. Born, Deborah Born, congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, for our next prize, we have Korean chopsticks and spoon sets. We will be selecting six people. Rico Newman. Congratulations. Athim Melia, Athim Melia, 
Bayou Dardias Kerniadi. Oh, over there. Congratulations. <laughs> Bella Struminska. Bella Struminskaya. Maida Tada Hilso. I'm sorry if I mispronounce it. Maida, M A E D A, and Tadahiko. <laughs> Anastasia from Jet Brains. Anastasia. Kim Wol Ha from Songgyungwan University. <laughs> Yan Kareem Hone, Yan Linda Guerrero, Linda Guerrero, congratulations. Chun Su Min from Kozda. Chun Su Min. Alimov Muzafar. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, we have our last but not least prize. We're going to select four people for USB sets decorated with traditional designs. First winner, Johan Miyatani. Martha Galina. Congratulations. Lucrecia Mina. Lucrecia. Francesco Sarasino. <laughs> Congratulations. And our last winner is Donna Meliver. Donna Meliver. Olga Kamenchuk from Northwestern. Olga Kamenchuk. Lydia Repke, R-E-P-K-E. -E. Congratulations. Congratulations once again. So that is it for today's prize. If you haven't won in the lucky draw, don't be disappointed. You still have a great opportunity to receive your gift. Please visit the PMI booth on the first floor of the International Hall and participate in our brief survey. You can receive a lovely bookmark and a fan featuring Taeguk Mark. So if you haven't taken the survey yet, we encourage you to come by our booth and collect your gift. That's 
That wraps up PMI's Lucky Draw. Thank you all for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed our event. This has been Juyeon and Youngjun. from PMI. We look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you. Bye.